Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. I'm Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. David, what an episode. Arthur Zero X, what did we cover today? We covered a little bit of everything, and and I, we started off with the story of how Arthur Zero X and Defiance Capital came to be, and it's already one of my favorite stories in DeFi, favorite stories in Ethereum, and it's something that I feel really, really passionate about is that if you are coming into the space and you see things and you notice things and you start to execute on the things that you noticed, you too, just like Arthur Zero X, might be able to turn $100,000 into a $100 million plus fund. Like that option and that choice is available to you if you have the, the grit and the patience and the foresight to be able to see the things that Arthur Zero X saw and why he was able to turn Defiance Capital into the gargantuan that it is in this space. We covered much more than that. And so I'll leave that to you, Ryan, to explain to the listeners, but that was my favorite part. <laughs> You're gonna give that back to me. Yeah, look, yeah. man, it was, my, it was my favorite part too. This story is amazing. Six figures to nine figures, right? And mm -hmm. the, the thing I would add to that is you also have the grit to stick with this during a bear market. I think that's key. If you're If you're looking for that like, 50x 100x type of return mm -hmm. you have to believe in something when no one else does right right, right now we're in a you know we're in a hot ish warm ish bull market it was not that way in 2018 when arthur was was uh growing up in DeFi, and when he was investing in things no one else was touching these tokens were like <laughs> everyone hated tokens mm -hmm. at the tokens time. were out Tokens were totally out. Anyway, we cover that. That that uh, story is amazing. We we talk about Defiance Capital has focus on fundamentals, which is mm -hmm. really cool to hear. Not just not narratives, not sentiment, but actual fundamentals of tokens, and ignore the rest. Listener, that is an option for you. You don't have to go chase all of the narratives that you hear and see in crypto. You could just focus on fundamentals. Refreshing here that we did an automated market maker comparison. Why are Sushi and Uniswap valued differently? How about Curve? How about Bancor? How about Balancer? Will one automated market maker win the network effect? Will there be many? We also talked about ETH killers. Um, I will not give away <laughs> Arthur's conclusion there because I think he had some great conclusions. I even asked him, if he had to pick one non-Ethereum layer one, which would he be and why he answered that question? Then we talked about and concluded this with uh, DeFi from a an Asian perspective. So from the perspective of Asia, I should say. And Arthur had a great kind of, um, I guess, categorization of different areas in Asia that aren't like jurisdiction-based, but are more kind of cultural alignment uh, that I think was super useful and will be listener useful to listeners as well. And of course, we concluded with price predictions because you know we just had to because it's bankless and it's fun. Well, we also concluded with what Arthur is really excited about towards yeah, the end of 2021, true. and he actually he actually gave a really interesting answer. Uh, and well, I'll, I'll tease it real quick here because it was actually the elaboration I think was the cool part. He thinks he's really excited for scale, as we all are. We've been beating the layer two summer drum here on Bankless, but Arthur thinks that. Once we have scale, the floodgates for users just absolutely open. Uh, and so we dive into that a little bit as well towards the end of the conversation. But uh, as a recap, that was the whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> really cool story, guys. You are going to enjoy this. So before we get into the episode, we want to thank the sponsors that made this possible. Bankless is proud to be supported by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum, which is what Ryan and I call a money robot. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. Something brand new in the Uniswap ecosystem is the Uniswap Grants program is now accepting applications for grants. We have been saying this for a while and we'll say it again. DAOs have money and they are in need of labor. If you think that you have something to contribute to the Uniswap DAO, apply for a grant to Uniswap. Just look at the size of the Uniswap treasury. 
it's almost $3 billion. This mountain of capital is looking for labor. Do you have something of value to contribute to the Uniswap DAO? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at unigrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. That's exactly what we did to get Uniswap to be a sponsor for Bankless, and you can do the same for your project. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. Balancer is a powerful platform for flexible automated market makers. Typical AMMs just have two tokens inside of one liquidity pool, which can lead to fractured liquidity across the many pairs in DeFi. With Balancer, you can access the full power of multiple tokens inside of one single AMM, which unlocks an entirely new playing field of possibility. This makes Balancer an awesome building block for so many different use cases. Balancer pools can make asset indices, but instead of paying fees to portfolio managers, Balancer lets you collect the fees from traders who use your portfolio for liquidity. Additionally, Balancer smart pools can be programmed to have properties that change according to predetermined rules, such as changing the swap fee based on market conditions, or even liquidity bootstrapping pools, which can help you launch and distribute your token with day one liquidity. At Bankless, we use a liquidity bootstrapping pool to sell our BAP t-shirts to much success. Balancer V2 brings powerful new features that makes your money work even harder for you. In V2, idle tokens are capable of generating yield in DeFi without sacrificing liquidity in the pool using Balancer's asset managers. Balancer's vault architecture lets you trade between Balancer pools at a fraction of the cost versus trading on other platforms. Balancer's mission is to become the primary source of liquidity in DeFi by providing the most flexible and powerful platform for asset management and decentralized exchange. Dive into the Balancer pools at app.balancer.fi. Bankless Nation, we are super excited about our next guest. Arthur Zero X is one of the most successful DeFi investors in the entire crypto space. He runs Defines Capital, which is the largest DeFi focused fund in Asia. He's based in Singapore, funded by tons of investors, maybe most notably by the Three Arrows, Three Arrows Capital folks, Suzu and Kyle Davies. Arthur, we have so much to talk about, man. I'm glad you joined us today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, been a listener of Bangla since day one, and it's my pleasure to be here. That's awesome. Uh, well, very cool. Well, we we have been a follower of yours for a long time as well, and I want to kind of start with this uh, this story, which is kind of your story of getting into DeFi and getting into crypto. Um, I understand that you went full time into crypto in um, 2018. So. Lots of folks managing funds have been in crypto for longer. You tweeted this out, and I think this is uh, incredible. 500 million and 50K followers. What comes next? 5K ETH? I hope so. Maybe 10K ETH? <laughs> um, but 500 million, 50K followers. You started in crypto full-time in 2018. That is incredible, man. That's an incredible story. How did that happen? Tell us. Yeah. So... Uh... It's a long story, um, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's, there's some useful takeaways, so I'll share a, a bit more. I started in the space in 2018. Um, initially, I want to run a crypto research startup because I think initially, when I came into the space, I realized that uh, there's a lot of uh, focus on the hype and the promises, but there is lack of uh, focus on what's really happening and how to value this thing properly. So I initially wanted to run a crypto research startup, but I didn't find product market fit. So what happened is I decided to focus on investing instead, but that was the bear market. So 2018, you know, Bitcoin went to 3,000. ETH went to the lowest point, I think it was 80 plus dollar. Um, but I think uh, during that uh, period of time, I was always asking myself, so uh, besides just trading and speculation, what other use case can we get from crypto? And coming from someone who went through the ICO bubble, um, I think that's very important because during that period, everyone who have experienced it must have realized that we can literally see all the different use cases being experimented, um, travel and what, Airbnb on blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, Spotify on blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. Uber on the blockchain. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think none of them are really uh, being realized or achieved in a major way, um, except for financial use cases. I think uh, at the end of 2018, um, I think the first time I heard about DeFi was in, I think, January 2019. But I know the term was coined in late 2018. 
by a group of early DeFi teams such as uh, I think it's the Set Protocol, uh, Dharma, and a few mm-hmm. others. They just joined together and say, why don't we create a term for this new movement? And then the term DeFi was born. Um, yeah, so um, I think, and this is also part of the extension of my stablecoin thesis because um, when, when I was uh, helping some of the new crypto startup initially, uh, a lot of them want to introduce their own token as a payment mechanism, but uh, it has shown not to be working well. In fact, it just uh, doesn't work at all because nobody wants to use a new token to pay for any services. People want to use a common currency. Uh, in crypto world, that will most likely be ETH or Bitcoin. But uh, right now, I would say that uh, stable coin is actually the most uh, suitable payment. It's just that people want a stable union account. Um, and I think that time stablecoin just started to took off uh, because bear market people want to find a safe haven and stablecoin become a natural selection. And I think that um, being bullish on a stablecoin also lead me to bullish on DeFi as well because uh, DeFi uh, allow this uh, whole uh, exchange of uh, crypto assets uh, between stablecoin and the volatile one. And this is a, a very obvious use cases. And after that, the extension of lending and borrowing um, after being a user of this, I can just uh, see how important it is uh, to the entire space. So that's why I started to do more research into DeFi, start being a power user and early um, early supporter. And obviously being a very early user of Synthetix community helps a lot as well. And that kind of uh, lasts me through most of 2019. Um, being an early DeFi user and community uh, member, um, especially in the Synthetix. And I think uh, what really changed is, um, I think, so I think the DeFi market, uh, synthetic start to did quite well around there. And I think around 2020, um, the whole space before DeFi summer uh, start to grow pretty well on an organic level. But then after DeFi summer, it just was just like a, a explosive moment that uh, everyone realized that DeFi is not a fad, um, that a lot of people start to really recognize that the, there's a lot of potential in this. And yeah, and I think at that moment, uh, I raised uh, Defiance Capital and uh, we have grown very fast since then. So uh, with the support of Three Arrows Capital, we have uh, raised around um, round mid eight figures of capital, uh, but Three Arrows and myself are the largest investor. And throughout the, from 2020, second half of 2020 until now, we have grown tremendously to around, around low to mid nine figures of capital right now. Obviously, like, the the vet, the figures change a lot depending on the market condition but yeah that's where we are right now um yeah i think that that's uh yeah we can go deeper into any part we would like to Arthur, that's that's a pretty incredible story and, and bankless listeners um i i want you to to draw out a few things that arthur said there as as he um started with kind of a thesis uh but then he also became a defi super user which is interesting there uh, and then uh, turned kind of investor, turned fund manager. Um, but, but the amounts that you're managing are, are pretty incredible, Arthur. And I'm just like curious because I think a lot of people listening are DeFi super users, also um, DeFi investors. Uh, and they're pretty excited about your trajectory because they, you know, want a similar trajectory. They're interested in the path that, that you've taken. Um, so like, what is it? Was, was, was it just this combination of right place, right time, you being a DeFi super user, you applying a thesis at a time when the market was, was bearish and then it flipped, flipped bullish? What's kind of the, the secret ingredient for your success here? Because I think a lot of listeners want to emulate this. I think there's a, um, I would say that uh, I think that there's no secret. Uh, it's more like, um, after doing your research or so-called homework, uh, a really strong belief in your research, uh, in your understanding. And obviously that is based on the, uh, that you, your research is the right research. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of time people are very affected by what is happening now, but not, not on what has happened over the last, uh, what was the previous trend and what is the ongoing trend. So if you, always focus on the current point of the market, um, you're always going to draw a very different conclusion because crypto can be in a bull market in two months, in the bear market in two months, which is what we have experienced recently. But 
if you look at the crypto in 2018, yes, uh, there was a, the bubble and yeah, a lot of the misallocation of capital, but uh, the usage of crypto actually has been increasing. And even that time, uh, we see a very small glimpse into the potential of NFT. I was also the very early uh, player of uh, crypto kitty as well. So I think, yeah, obviously the NFT whole thing really come off right around early this year, right? But the whole, the first glimpse into the potential already happened two years ago. And for DeFi is actually, you can also argue that, uh, yeah, you see the potential of DEXs when Ether Delta came on the scene, but it just also was two years <laughs> too early <laughs> until Uniswap really changed the game. So I think that uh, by looking into the previous uh, usage and the early sign of product market fit, and you look at where the world want to go next, I think you can you can really, the so-called cliche zoom out, uh, that gives you a lot more confidence on where the world is going. So I think that uh, the, the biggest factor for me is really the persistent, because I think uh, a lot of people drop out during the bear market, but I believe that what we are doing is just not all hype and just there's actually something bigger that we are building. And obviously I think being early helps a lot, but I think the entire space is still incredibly early. Um, there are some DeFi projects where investors, when I invested is around less than hundred million market cap. And right now I think there's still quite a lot of promising DeFi protocol that are trading at below hundred million market cap as well. And I have no doubt some of them will become a billion dollar DeFi protocol in the future. And these are, can, Most can of them tell are us which ones. Uh, I, mean, wanna... <laughs> I, <can't laughs> I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to be this like a top my back section. But I think um most of them that which I mentioned that uh, they are actually publicly listed already. Like you can buy them from Uniswap, from some of the centralized exchanges. So yeah, you don't even need to like get into private sale to get in. Yep. Here's the other thing that you were doing at a time when it wasn't popular, because in, in 2017, we, it was the era of futil futility tokens, like pointless tokens that were injected in protocols, right? In, in 2018, it was not popular to make a bet on a token. Like tokens were out. They were dead. I mean, they were useless, right? That This is what the market sentiment held. And that's why we saw, saw even while there was early traction in DeFi protocols, um, tokens just weren't being valued probably the way they, they should um, be valued. W was that a core part of your thesis at the time that, hey, these tokens are actually worth something even though the market is is highly discounting them? Yes. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's where I was uh, quite different with most of the consensus back then because uh, I think, first of all, my... I used to be very adamant and I think I right now I'm still have a very strong focus if it's just on token value accrual. I think especially in the bear market, um, there is really, uh, during the 2018, there was really no bottom, especially especially for so, the so-called altcoins. After they drop 90%, they can still drop another 80%. So I think at that point of time, value accrual become extremely important because there should be some base flaw in the value if the token is, uh, if, if the, if the product is being used and people are using it. So if the product is used, there should be some value being captured and this value should provide like a flaw to the value in the token. So you know that it will not go to zero and that gives the token holder a lot more confidence in holding during the bad time. So that was the, the way I approached it during the bear market. And, and I think that this actually extends to most of the token. I think that some form of value accrual has to be because else what are we really investing? I mean, the so-called futility token, um, yeah, is it, the investor doesn't need to hold them. We only need to purchase them when we need to pay for certain token services, which is why that the demand factor would be so weak. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a very major difference. And I think that uh, the unique thing about token is uh, because I personally did a lot of research. So what is the best way to design a good token and how do we make it like uh, integrated into the platform? Uh, I think that there's two main purposes a token should serve. First, it has to have a strong value accrual. The second thing is uh, it should serve as a growth catalyst for the protocol and the community because I think this is the advantage of token compared to the traditional equity because you can't really freely give out the equity to your user and community member due to like various regulatory restrictions. But for token, you have a lot of uh, leeway to innovate with this. And this is actually a very strong advantage that the, the crypto community should not give up on. Yep. Arthur, one thing I think is really cool about your story, and I, and I want to go more into fundamentals, and, and we're about to get into that in a sec, but I, don't, I want to still uh, talk about the story of Defiance Capital and, and you, Arthur. Uh, 
you, you, you go through, you, you came into this world in 2017, you go through the, the bear market with us in 2018, 2019 with me, we're, we're both uh, uh, students of the 2017 era. Uh, and I, I, I want to impress upon, upon the listeners that you came out of just your first cycle, starting to manage a fund. But I also, uh, I also, Arthur, I want to ask, how old are you? Uh, how old are you? And, 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 and uh, yeah, how old are you? I'm currently 29 years old. And you're managing a fund, so that's fund where somewhere between 200 and 500 million dollars, depending on the emotions of the crypto markets. Does that ever scare you? Does that is that a scary thing? Because that's a lot of money, and <laughs> you're and you're you're 29 years old. That's that's a crazy thing that I think we could only find in crypto. Do you ever reflect on just the the magnitude of the discrepancy between the the size of the fund and and how young you are? Um, yeah, actually. Um, yes, um, but I think there's actually another factor I, uh, I, I'm more impressed and surprised by. Actually, I think in the, even in traditional finance, you do have some of the like a successful trader managing a few hundred million dollars of capital. Um, but I think most of these are not their capital. But I think for crypto, I'll say uh, it's not just for our fund, but a lot of other funds as well. Like the principal capital is probably a majority of the investment fund. Uh, same for Defiance. So... I think in that sense, yeah, it's quite amazing that how, uh, yeah, how people at our age uh, can accumulate such an amount of capital and just managing such an amount of swing. I think this is really uh, brings to the fact that crypto is a major level playing field uh, and for everyone from different backgrounds because I didn't come from like a very uh, wealthy family and it was like a, actually I came to Singapore only 10 years ago. So I think that's a, and crypto just really give uh, everyone the opportunity to who willing to put in the effort, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the and meaning willing to make it happen. So I think that that's the the fact I'm definitely impressed by. I, I think that's what listeners should really walk away with right now is is uh, you know when Arthur is telling his story about just the formulation of his thoughts in 2017, 2018. As somebody that also came into the world of crypto around that same time, I very much resonated resonated with these these thought structures or thought patterns that Arthur was having about what he thought about the market at the time. And you know, so I, I think listeners should understand that like it's possible to come into the world of crypto and look around and formulate an opinion as to what's going on, and then turn that into a fund or turn that into something. Arthur here turned it into a fund. Um, other people can turn it into something else. But the uh, the how far you have to go into this industry to start really making a difference and doing something cool is not as deep as what people thought, uh, and and that's the opportunity that I think a lot of listeners uh, should come to or conclusion that they should come to is that you can come in and figure out what's going on in the world of crypto. You got to got to do your homework for a year or two, um, but then you look around and start formulating an opinion and start to test that and turn that into something viable. Uh, and so, Arthur, maybe you could just go in a, a little bit more into just the details of to how you established your own confidence in your ability to call the shots, or your own confidence in your that your your theses and your uh, beliefs about the crypto world were the right world. Were, did you ever have like doubts, or did you ever have like concerns, or just tell us the story of just like coming into uh, the the shoes of a five hundred million dollar fund? Sure. I think uh, I used to say that uh, in the tweets a few days ago, uh, confidence is the memory of winning. And I believe that uh, it should be the same for everyone. Like when you're doing something and you keep getting certain form of validation from your action and then your confidence will just increase. And I think that um, in the initial phase, um, I think it took a while uh, because I think that my first bet was synthetics and uh, it took a while for the thesis to be realized, but I think that it's also a come from a fact that sometimes you have to do it yourself. Right? I think the early stage where people wasn't recognizing the potential of synthetics, I actually, um, and it was during a bear market, I took upon myself uh, and spent, I think, close to one and a half month to write a, like a really comprehensive report. Um, mm. And actually that report was not perfect. And uh, I think even if you look at it right now, it's already outdated. Um, so I don't suggest people to go and search it up. But I think, you have to um, um, do something to uh, believe in yourself and uh, make it happen uh, to just really uh, put it out there and see what, what kind of result you get. And I think the result was actually overwhelmingly positive. 
And then I think after a few months, the, the market start reacting to that. And then I just keep applying the same approach to the different DeFi protocol, which I invested in, you know, spend time in the community, help out and, you know, help to popularize them. And also just communicate with the team and see if any value we can add as much as possible. And I think th this approach is uh, it's actually quite universal. It's just that not many people are doing in the crypto that time. I think when you look at the like, traditional uh, venture capital, they also like lend a lot of support to the community. And I think this probably also brings my experience from uh, like stock investing, because I think in a stock investing world, there's something called the activist investing. Actually not just stock, I mean, there's something, uh, there's this in the bond market as well. Like, the investor will really uh, try to effect some changes in the companies or the, the, the stuff they're invested in and to get value out of it. I think that um, in crypto, similarly, you can actually apply this concept and actually to a bigger extent because um, most of the crypto on DeFi protocol are very early stage and the team will very happily interact with most of the community members. So you can really uh, make your, uh, have a lot of influence on the future, on how the protocol is being run. Yeah, so I think just just keep doing this and you, the feedback you get will just help you to build a lot of confidence and this is how you get to that level. Arthur, was there a moment where it just became obvious that the next step for you needed to be starting a fund? Was there was there ever, or did you always want to start a fund? Um, what, what was the inflection point where it, Defiance Capital became a thing? What, what, what was the signal that you got from the market that you needed to start a fund? I think uh, the signal was uh, the success we have been getting, uh, the growth we've been getting even before the fund was formed. Um, it's a, it was a very strong validation of our investment thesis and approach. Um, yeah, so although we started from a very low base, but uh, our return was uh, pretty insane uh, for most of 2019 and 2020, because uh, no, I mean, if when you look at it, most fund, even, even a small one, they don't really outperform Bitcoin. Uh, for until 2020. Uh, I, think, I think the outperform Bitcoin part only started this year where you see stuff like Polkadot and all the stuff start going like crazy, like 20X or 15X. Um, but I think 2020, um, 2019 and 2020 was quite hard to outperform Bitcoin um, because uh, just Bitcoin dominance was so strong during that period. But we have managed to did that um, and then uh, just keep doing that uh, for, most of the, for most of the time. And we have been seeing our investment thesis being validated, like some of our call. It was actually quite public because I was a uh, you know I was quite active on Twitter fairly early on, and most of our call was validated in a very convincing way. So let's uh, talk a little bit about that investment thesis, Arthur. I I think we want to spend some time here. Um, so Defiance Capital, you guys say we invest in DeFi eating traditional finance. That is something definitely. Um, bankless listeners are quite familiar with. We talk about it all the time. DeFi is going to eat traditional finance. But I find it strikely, striking as, as you as kind of a crypto super user, a crypto native, have sort of started um, Defiance as a crypto native fund. So um, you're, you're able to do things like invest directly in DAOs. There's an interesting post by uh, Kane Warwick, who is the, one of the founders of Synthetics, uh, he wrote a post on Dow first capital formation. I thought it was really interesting because he he makes the point, and this was, I believe, addressed to founders where he says, hey, founders, like, why go the traditional VC route and legal structure route when you're going to decentralize all of those things anyway? Why not just start with a Dow first and start with that structure? Uh, you know you're going to end up in, in that structure to begin with, so why not save some time? What's interesting about, I, I believe, the way Defiance is structured is you can more easily invest and are more comfortable, maybe prefer to invest in crypto native DAO type vehicles like that. Can you talk about the edge that that gives Defiance and how important it is for investors to look at crypto native capital coordination vehicles like DAOs? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I think we are one of the, one of the crypto native fund. They are able to invest in DAO directly because um, yeah, we just that because we have been in the space for a very long time, so we are comfortable comfortable with this kind of structure. And DAO also, um, in a way that there is uh, some protection to the investor as well, because most DAO are structured by uh, the way that the you need some majority to make some major decision. And sometimes the most of the time, the investor will also have some uh, some decision making 
uh, responsibility as well. And I think the importance is uh, especially uh, crucial for DeFi protocol because I think that the, there's a reason it's called decentralized finance. And I think um, with the recent regulatory action, uh, especially the latest, uh, I call it FATF uh, guidance, it was recently being delayed to October, but um, it's still not 100% sure that uh, how, how is it going to be? And there's like, the potential to be a very strict interpretation of that, which going to regulate DeFi protocol the same way as a centralized crypto company. Or, you know, but the DeFi uh, industry is obviously trying to um, lobby for uh, like a much more sensible uh, guidance. But regardless, I think that it's important to, for the DeFi protocol to find a way to gradually decentralize. And I think DAO is one of the best structure to do that. So yeah, this is why that we, we really support this, uh, this uh, DAO capital structure formation. Yep. Arthur, um, something else you guys have emphasized, and we even started talking about it when we, you talked about um, token value accrual, is this focus on fundamentals. And we, we've talked to a ton of different um, crypto native funds and, and traditional kind of crypto funds on Bankless. Uh, and I, I haven't quite heard the emphasis on fundamentals from the others as, as you seem to have. A lot of them talk about sentiment. A lot of them talk about narratives. A lot of them talk about um, community. Can, can you tell us what you mean when you talk about um, fundamentals? What are fundamentals in crypto and why are they important in this industry that seems like it's sometimes just based on memes? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so there's, I think every fund actually do look at fundamentals, but they will probably define fundamentals in a different way. So uh, for us, fundamentals uh, means that the team quality, the valuation of the protocol and to uh, extension to the team quality is that the execution track record, have they built something valuable? What's their previous history? The technical architecture, because sometimes we find that the whole thing, the design to be unfair or sometimes the design is superior. The community involvement and the token value accrual and the last but not least, the near-term catalyst. So these are most of the fundamental factors we look at. And to us, uh, fundamental matters a lot because uh, I think it, when, you, when in crypto, right, um, the correlation very often go to one when the market is dropping. So actually in a sense, um, if you are talking about downside protection, uh, there is not, not, not that much reason to be very diversified. Like you want to avoid the risk where one of the protocol got hacked and then you lose 100% of your investment. But um, if you want to diversify just to prevent like the, the correlation risk, um, there, there's not much reason in that because everything go down at the same time. But when in the bull market, when the token is rallying, you can see a lot more dispersion. Like some uh, will do a lot better. Like some did like around 500% in the Q1 this year, but some only did like 100%. So I think that uh, by focusing on the fundamental, you can capture this kind of a positive divergence when the market is rallying. And I think that market do pay attention to the fundamentals, um, but often it can get crowded out by the, the very noisy stuff. Like, um, like, and I think this is part of the extension of the current world we are being in. Like, uh, there's a meme coin investing in the stock market as well. And to a certain extent, there's like a meme, sorry, meme, meme stock investing in the stock market and a meme coin investing in the crypto world, like the Dogecoin and the Shiba and all the stuff. <laughs> uh, but I think that ultimately there's a very different kind of audience looking at this stuff. Like the, the smart money will always look at the fundamental. It's just how they interpret it. Uh, is everyone have a slightly different way of interpreting it? Arthur, I just looked at uh, Coin Market Cap like sometime earlier today. Um, there's some sort of uh, coin dashboard, and, and Shiba was at over four billion dollars in fully diluted valuation, and that just blew my mind for, first. And second, it made me a little bit sad, right? <laughs> just a little bit sad because, um, like, there are so many interesting assets in crypto, so many capital assets with, with cash flow, so many DeFi assets um, with protocols behind them that are going to change the world and eat the rest of finance. But invest people out there are out chasing like meme coins. Uh, and and that, that just kind of makes me sad, I guess, for, for crypto. But, but you're saying you have hope. You're saying that in the longer term, 
that um, crypto markets are going to value fundamentals so highly. I, ge I guess my question is, how do you explain, explain things like Litecoin or XRP or, or the Shibas of the world uh, in that context? Are they going to ultimately just diminish while the fundamental assets are going to increase? Or are we just in a world like of, of funhouse mirrors and, and narratives and maybe like fundamentals are kind of pushed aside in this, in this new market that we live in? Like, give, give me some more hope here on the on why fundamentals matter more than narratives. Yeah, I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a gradually changing process. Um, I want to draw an analogy from the stock market. So before Benjamin Graham uh, published uh, the book called Security Analysis, uh, the market uh, for the larger period of time uh, doesn't know how to value a stock properly. So I think the stock like 70, 80 years ago was actually quite similar to crypto now. Like there was a lot of hype and speculation um, and people don't really know how to value it uh, properly. And the discounted cash flow model uh, were only popularized, I think, around like I think 19, sorry, I probably get a year's around like 50 or 60s. And then gradually the process are being refined and people start to talk about the discount rate and what is the equity risk premium. So all these things take time to develop. I think we're in a similar phase in crypto where uh, there was there's no consensus on how to value crypto asset yet and as a result and people also have a very uh, like a very surface view like normal people have a very surface view on what uh, is crypto because when they come into crypto they they always talk about bitcoin first and this is called cryptocurrency right and then to an extent they think all most of it are like currency currency ish crypto but like, i mean you guys have talked about it like a lot of the crypto especially in the defi space are capital asset um, they produce cash flow. They're what we call the productive assets. So the way you look at them is very different from the way you look at the currency. Um, I think that unfortunately that there's still a lot of education we need to do. I think that uh, the DeFi community over the last few years is really a lot more focused on building the right product. And because the scalability is not soft yet, so we don't want to onboard the mainstream user too early. But unfortunately that the bull market came and then the, the, the retail was always onboarded to the exciting stuff and where the opportunist actor was always trying to capture the attention. Like, like look at Shiba Swap, right? I mean, I think this is my view and my research, but I think that there are some good people behind that and they are not doing it for altru altruistic reason. I think they are, you know, they are probably have some game plan behind it. And then these people are always at like the market here, right? They always know how to capture the retail's attention. And a lot of DeFi people are really want to build a good product and they want to make sure their product is good enough before they really start to market it out to the wider audience. So I don't think this is, are going to change immediately. But I think it's a gradual process where market is just slowly getting smarter and smarter um, through various cycle. It might not happen as fast as we hope to be, uh, but I think it's, it's definitely changing because um, this is how like the fundamental investment approach uh, we are able to use to uh, generate so much return for us and our investor, right? Let I me mean, we went from like a low six figures of uh, capital to around like nine figures of capital. And all these are done through a fundamental investment processes. A frequent metaphor we use on the Bankless program is that we are speed running the history of money and finance. And I, I guess when you, you, Arthur, you say that uh, previous markets had equal amounts of trouble valuing fundamentals, I guess we should incorporate that. And as knowledge, when we, when we say that crypto speed running the history of money and finance, well, it's not doing it in one year. Like it's not going to happen that fast. It's going to happen in, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And so we are still likely going to go through a phase where the market is having trouble understanding what the hell it is, what, what, what is the assets that are inside of these things. And Arthur, one of the fundamental metrics or fundamental drivers that you say that you pay attention to over at Defiant is a token value capture and does the token actually capture value? Now, there's a lot, wide range of, of token models that exist out there that we could, and I don't, we don't have the time to go through every single one, but I want, to, I, want, I want to ask you to pull apart two examples that you have seen in the DeFi space of one token that has a really strong token value capture mechanism that you just really, really like, or, or a handful, and then some other tokens that, while you like the project and maybe the project adds, adds value to the world, the token just doesn't capture any value. Can you kind of uh, compare and contrast some winners and some losers in this category, just for examples for our, our listeners? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I think I was a very big proponent of the synthetics uh, token economics from the beginning because uh, I think they are the one that pioneered using like a token inflation to incentivize the community uh, and also incentivize the early adopter because uh, the inflation starts from a pretty high level, but it's gradually tapered down. So it reward the early user who uh, really believe in the protocol and uh, take, took the initial risk. So I think this is very, uh, very good design. And also there's a very obvious value capture where by taking the risk of uh, staking in a synthetic protocol, uh, the token holder are rewarded by the fee generated by the protocol at the same time, both in the native token and also in the extra fee income that was generated by people trading on a synthetic protocol. So I think that uh, by taking some of our risk, they are also um, rewarded in some sort of income. So I think this is uh, usually the, like a pretty universal principle. And I still think that it's a pretty good design. Um, obviously, that the, when it comes to hedging the debt uh, exposure, it was always quite problematic. Other design, I think it was very well designed. But uh, until right now, I think not enough people have understand it, which is uh, bank call. So actually, bank call, um, they went through a lot of iteration. I think right now, they finally arrived at the token economic model that make a lot of sense. So out of so many uh, DEXs protocol, actually Bancor captured the most value uh, for the token holder. I think 40 to 60% of the fee actually go to the Bancor token holder, but it doesn't come in the form of, uh, of income. It actually comes in the form of the burning. And there's also consistent of the so-called inflation or to support a new liquidity pool as well. But actually it was quite complicated. I think most people don't really realize that. So as a result, they are still not really uh, value highly. But actually we, our team wrote a, a blog post on that one uh, explaining how the mechanism works. So I think for the more detail-minded people, they're happy to take a look. Yeah, so I think both these uh, have a very uh, good design. And I think for lending and borrowing protocol, Aave and Compound, the value accrual is quite similar. Um, they both take a, a small uh, percentage from the interest owned uh, that uh, accrue to the depositor and go to the treasury. I think in the future, the token holder can vote on how the treasury uh, is uh, the accumulated reserve is going to be used. Uh, it can be returned to the token holder or other investment into the protocol. Um, and I think for Aave, uh, the token holder is, it is quite similar for Maker as well. The token holder is also act, acting as a backstop to the solvency of the protocol as well. So I think this is a, a, a very uh, sound economic design. So yeah, it took them a while to actually come to this uh, design as well. So I think that um, in terms of, uh, and then you have a lot of the DeFi protocol that just doesn't capture value at all, right? And they also have no very, con they don't have a very concrete plan how to get there as well. Um, I think, yeah, so I think those are just that the team and community need to figure it out. So uh, I think another more controversial point I have is I think, uh, I think at this stage, uh, buy back and burn is um, it's probably not the most optimal solution because uh, in a way, I think that the placeholder have uh, published a blog post called buy back and make, and they actually argue that uh, buy back and burn when the protocol still have a lot of growth potential is actually destroying capital. And I really agree with this because when you look at an early stage startup in the traditional world, uh, nobody is just uh, like doing share buyback or like giving out dividend that early. Actually, I mean, giving dividends sometimes, but usually it's one-off. It's not like a consistent dividend policy. Like you, when, you, when you have a lot of growth potential, you always want to reinvest in the growth. And that's actually fine. So... Yeah, I think the buyback and burn at, for most of the DeFi protocol right now is a bit too early. That they should actually find a way to uh, reinvest this protocol or even just give back to the token holder. Right? It's, I think it's still better than like, burning the capital directly. I, although I understand there's some uh, tax implication for the, like, the returning the, the, the dividend, so-called dividend to the token holder, but I think that a better way can still be designed. So Arthur, so you don't love the the buyback and burn, or probably the um, distributing cash flow too too early back to token holders, because your argument is like should reinvest back into into the protocol. I I'm I'm curious about this because we have uh, some protocols sitting on now billions of dollars worth in treasury, right? So like one that comes to mind is uh, the Uniswap team. We talk about it often. Um, billions in their treasury. And they've got like 15, 20 people on their team. And so like, what 
could they possibly invest back into? Like those billions of dollars, um, they're not like a, a large bank where they have office floors and physical infrastructure and tons of employees and, you know, in suits and in ties and, you know, travel expenses and all of these things. Uh, it's just like 20 people in a protocol. So wh what about that argument that, hey, if the protocols don't have anything to do with the money uh, and what what should protocols spend on, m maybe they should um, push some of those funds back to the token holders. Any thoughts there? Um, yeah, I think that is a very sensible point. Um, I think that, but I, I don't think that most DeFi protocol would not find a way to utilize uh, their capital um, effectively. I think Uniswap is an outlier just because of how highly valued they are. And as a result, their treasury is massive because the token is worth a lot. But I think most DeFi protocol do not have that huge amount of capital. And I mean, setting aside some for as a reserve for future usages, um, I think that most of them can find a good way to uh, invest those capital. Like you can invest in more education. Um, I think this is always like, you, you're always fighting attention um, against the meme, meme coin, right? So why don't the DeFi protocol invest in more educational channel, more outreach effort, more translation, more in the local community so that not just the English speaking community uh, understand what DeFi is about, uh, but the community from all the other world as well. I think that, I think some, some protocol did it better, but I think generally uh, most of the DeFi protocol we are speaking to are, because they are early stage as well, are a lot more focused on improving their product instead of like reaching out to the new community because yeah, I, and I think that you guys actually, the bankless did a very good job like by translating your content to multiple languages to reach out to more community. I think this is what that uh, a lot of the protocol can could have done better. And actually, this, uh, it just takes a lot of effort and yeah, you, you might just need to hire a lot more people. Arthur, we want to keep on going down the fundamentals rabbit hole. And I ultimately want to get to kind of an AMM comparison because I think there's a lot to be learned, a lot to be gleaned from talking about all the different indexes and how we see the market valuing these things. But before we get there, we need to talk about all the different metrics that one could use to evaluate a protocol. So, so Arthur, say you are coming up upon this new up and coming, uh, you know, DeFi protocol that you want to evaluate. What are the metrics that you really look to first? Is it, you know, uh, market cap, fully diluted uh, cap, you know, capital efficiency ratios. Like what are the, what are the basic uh, metrics that you look at first? And then maybe some of the more advanced ones as well. I think, I think the basic one, uh, okay. So I think it depends on whether the protocol already have a working product. So I think if you do not have a working product yet, it's really similar to how most VC look at it. The team, the track record, uh, the concept, um, the, the vertical they are voting, like does, are there any precedent and can they can you value them? So I think these are pretty standard. I probably will not go too much into it because this is really on like how the traditional VC like, think about investment. And, and say in the crypto, you have the token part. You want to think about how the how the team is planning to, to distribute the token and how, what do they plan to do with the token. So I think for those with already a working product, um, there's a few metrics I think matters a lot. Uh, it's actually, there's also a very good post on the Masari recently talking about which DeFi fundam which fundamentals of DeFi protocol matter the most. Um, I think that what we look at, uh, we look at, uh, first of all, uh, if it's a DEXs, we look at the volume. Uh, I think that's very universal. How much volume are they generated? And then after that, we look at the fee uh, value capture, if there's a fee value capture. So I think right now it's pretty standard. Like most uh, protocol cap, take, like um, for the non-stable coin protocol, they take a, uh, 0.05% of the uh, of the trading volume as a fee. And for the stable coin, they take slightly lower. I think Curve took like a 0.04% of the uh, trading volume or actually the fee uh, as a as an income. And then you look at the total value log. Um, and this actually represents like how um, how much capital this protocol is uh, securing. I think this is a very popular ratio in the DeFi space right now. And I think capital efficiency is on a case by case basis where I think some protocol is just optimized for more capital efficiency. Uh, I think that matters, but we still look at uh, the fee generated. Uh, I think that matter the most against the market cap of the protocol. So I think this is ultimately how uh, like a, a capital asset is being valued in the traditional finance, like a 
uh, price to earning ratio and to the like and to the extent the discounted cash flow, how much cash flow you're generating should uh, dictate how highly valued you are. And after factoring the the growth rate and the discount rate of the protocol. So, so these are the, the universal factor. But I think one factor that really drive a lot of the price action uh, is the user and the user growth. Because I think that uh, at this stage, um, uh, people understand the cash flow might not come immediately because, for example, Uniswap have no cash flow because they just don't have any value capture at the moment. Uh, but they're valued the most uh, among the DeFi protocol because they have a tremendous user base and their user growth is also one of the best in the industry. So I think this is a metric that, uh, although that there's no direct correlation with the value accrual, but it's something that the market is placing a lot of emphasis on. So what are some of the assets that you see out there, the protocols or, or projects that you see out there that would you say are undervalued based on the metrics that you look at? Are, is, are there any things that really just stand out as a complete outlier between their valuation and the actual fundamentals that the project holds? Yeah, I mean, disclaimer, I think this asset might be something that defines whole uh, position in. Um, I think that... Um, if, if you look at a, a pure metrics level, uh, you can actually just go to token terminal and then you can just sort the asset by price to sale ratio. And then you can just see our price to earning ratio. I think they're coming out with that as well. Then you can just see what is the most undervalued. I think we have always maintained that sushi sort is very undervalued because that, um, I mean, the given the volume they are doing, they should not uh, deserve such a huge dispatch. Um, I know a lot of people argue that, you know, uh, Uniswap V3 is going to kill SushiSwap because you know, SushiSwap is just like an older version, like V2 design. But the fact that that hasn't happened, um, because I think that uh, what we have seen over the last one to two months is Uniswap V3 is really optimized for the active uh, liquidity provider, which right now uh, means like the professional market makers. I think it's very hard for retail to be a passive liquidity provider on V3. And I think there are some backtests being run out of the sample size not big enough that they actually did not perform better than the V2. So um, I think there's pass passive LP still have its place. And as a result, and I think that at this ratio that Sushi is trading at, this market is basically pricing like zero growth. You know, the market that like, like Sushi is just not going to grow further, which I think that's not the case. And I think from a growth stage level, um, not looking beyond just the ratio. I think both Aave and Compound is uh, undervalued by the market because uh, I think among all the different DeFi verticals, lending and borrowing are the segment that with the most uh, defensible mode. So in a sense that I don't think there is any new lending and borrowing protocol using the similar design, uh, building on Ethereum can come in and disrupt them uh, within a year. I think it's just not possible because it takes a long time to build the trust uh, and build the, 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 the safety because like, both of them have operated for more than one year and there was no security incident as well. So I think these take time to build and yeah, and uh, it, the, it's also the vertical with the most obvious liquidity and network effect because uh, it's like if you do not have sufficient deposits in the platform, people can't borrow us a huge volume and vice versa. So it takes a long time to build out the network effect. And also because the token is worth a lot more, the, the in liquidity incentive they, they give out is more effective as well. So it's just very hard for the early stage protocol to compute Aave and Compound on, in this regard. Arthur, let's go into a little bit of a case study with all of the AMMs that are out there because there's a lot. There's there's Uniswap, Curve, SushiSwap, Bancor. And we've already talked a, a little bit about uh, some of these, but I want to go into more detail about specifically the, the sector of AMMs because I think that can really be an illustrative example. Um, you, Uniswap, you talked about how it has really high growth. Um, SushiSwap, you said how it is being uh, valued as if it's not going to grow. Uh, then you also earlier talked about Bancor and how it has a real it captured has captured a lot of value for its token holders. How do you see the market valuing these things differently? It seems to be that each one of them has their own like fundamentals, right? Each one of them is capturing some sort of fees, but it seems to be that the market is telling different stories based off of each of these different AMMs. Could you do you have a rationale or an explanation of why the why the market values these things so differently? I think that um, it's just like uh, right now market is in a way of uh, 
like the most of the investor when they look at DeFi, they want to invest in the growth. Um, and I think that in and as a result of that like Uniswap just captured the lion's share of the attention in the market and and they are the pioneer of that model as well. So market have a lot of confidence on Uniswap being able to maintain that dominance and being like the most cutting edge team as well. So I think as a result, their model is always being placed a lot of premium. And I think for other AMM model, um, the, the more unique one would be Balancer and Bangkok because Sushi Shop is just like the same design as a Uniswap V2. I think the market is, uh, is um, want to see like the, what, whether the differences can make up, can compete with the, with the V3 design. I think so. We are invested in both Bangkok and Balancer uh, because we think that uh, there is a value to their design and the way they present to the, to the user. But I think it takes time for the market to learn about it and to be convinced, right? Because Balancer was actually, uh, they, I think the second major DeFi protocol to kick off the liquidity mining. But after that, uh, the, the traction got taken away by Uniswap instead. And then it, it always takes time for the market to spend time to understand uh, a specific protocol. So and in you need some catalyst as well. So I, as it can become in the form of fundamental, let's say like I think XC Infinity, but it's not a DeFi protocol, but recently like the price have done very well, outperform most of the DeFi protocol. It's just that because the the revenue they're generating is just way too big to be ignored. So this can be a catalyst event that your fundamental is so superior that uh, the, the market just can't ignore it. Or you have some uh, catalyst where people are really um, um, amazed by the design. So I think both uh, Bangkok and Balancer, uh, we, they, they need this kind of event for people to really spend time understanding a desi this, their design and to come to a conclusion that this design actually uh, is really a, a very good design and the market should value them in a different way. So I think it, yeah, you, you usually need some event um, to capture the market attention and bear, to, for market to value you in a different way. I'd also throw maybe curve into the mix here. And I'm curious, Arthur, just uh, one other follow-up on the AMM portion of this conversation is um, the market also seems to be somewhat divided. And some, some folks believe that the AMM exchange world will be dominated by sort of a, a power law winner. So one automated market maker will dominate, say, 80% of, of the exchange market. Um, others believe that there will be many different automated market maker designs and you with an investment in Bancor and, and also Balancer is kind of more the long tail automated market makers at this point. Maybe that's more indicative of, of your belief. How do you think this shakes out? Will there be one power law winner or will we live in a world where with many different automated market makers? I think that there's no power law. Um, because uh, liquidity is very fungible in this space. And we have seen the scene have changed over the last uh, last one to two years as well. I think IDEX used to be the largest decentralized exchange until they decided to, uh, I think, make some changes. I think, I think implementing KYC probably affected <laughs> their fortune quite a fair bit. Um, and then, yeah, Uniswap came to the scene and then uh, main, have, uh, maintained their dominance uh, since then. But it's just that when you look at the centralized exchange, um, the fate has always changed, right? I mean, uh, Binance wasn't that dominant until 2018. Um, and then you have Bitfinex was used to be dominant and Polonix and the older time, the Chinese exchanges was the most dominant as well. So liqu liquidity is very fungible. Um, and, and in that sense that um, there's always possible for some AAM to come up with a new design and improve it and then just be more dominant for a certain period of time. So I think it's, uh, it's actually good for the end user because uh, everyone is just trying to come with a better design and compete with over time. And I think that you will see a power law for a certain period of time, but not forever. So I think that the situation can always change and you might end up in an equilibrium where just that there is no dominant MM, that everyone just have like a certain market share that is not changing too much. Um, and I think that if you subscribe to the aggregation theory, uh, what matters is the aggregator anyway, because they are gonna, for the, any order that are more than a certain size, you will always use aggregator to get the best pricing, rather than just go to one, uh, one AMM to to get the to to trade there. So I think in that sense, I I believe that um uh, yeah the power law is less likely to apply in the AMM because liquidity is very fungible. They will always move to the, to the AMM that give them the most uh, 
uh, like the best trade off for them. Like for I think right now for passive LP, uh, Bangkok is probably one of the best place because there's an impermanence protection. If you can stake for hundred days, uh, you're you are not gonna get any impermanent loss, and you get some extra reward as well from the fee. So I think that uh, for passive LP, these actually are in most cases, not all cases, a better decision that providing in a V3 because V3 you need to actively manage it and you need to change the range depending on market condition yeah yeah this is this is interesting so Arthur you're saying liquidity it doesn't necessarily have a uh, loyalty we could live in a world with many different automated market makers and if people believe in sort of aggregation theory then maybe some of these aggregators are more important the matchas of the world the one inches of the world I want to ask you another question with respect to network effects and power laws. And this is the question about Ethereum and ETH killers, or some people call them ETH attempted murderers. What's your take on ETH killers? Um, my take on ETH killer is most of them are not going to be able to uh, chip away at Ethereum's dominance except for very selected few protocols. I think my view, if I were to put a number, I would say there's probably less than five that will be able to chip away Ethereum's dominance, but they will not be able to kill Ethereum. So I think I, I've said in a, to a few, a lot of different people, so I think that Ethereum's dominance uh, will probably come down a little bit. Like I think, let's just talk about DeFi dominance, right? Or NFT dominance, like, 95% of the DeFi and NFT are built on Ethereum right now. I think in the next two years, we might see that coming down to 80% just because that other protocols start from ground zero. So their growth rate will always be faster than Ethereum because Ethereum is already the majority of the economic activity. So on a growth rate percentage, it's always going to be slightly lower because you're already bigger. Bigger stuff always grows slower, right? So but I think Ethereum's dominance is still going to stay at probably around 80%. Um, just because the network effect is so entrenched and Ethereum itself is also constantly improving as well. Like we have the uh, optimism and uh, later in the year, like the ZK Rob deploying as well. And then we have EVE 2.0 likely going to happen within the next three years as well. So I think that the dominance is going to maintain. But I do I, I will not write off the, the fate of all the so-called EVE killer completely because I think some of them... They are trying to carve like a, what we call the blue ocean strategy. They are trying to target really new user. They are not uh, on board into Ethereum right now. And I think the world is big enough for some of them to do well, but I don't think any of them will overtake Ethereum. So I, I'm curious about this, just digging into this, because um, you don't believe in a single dominant automated market maker, right? Because you think liquidity is doesn't have loyalty and is somewhat fleeting. But you seem to believe that um, a smart contract platform, a open financial platform like Ethereum has uh, more ability to maintain dominance. Why is that? Does Ethereum have like deeper no uh, moats than a Uniswap? And like, why do you think that Ethereum can achieve its dominance and retain its dominance, whereas an automated market maker can't? Yeah. I think, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that it's just a whole, uh, when you look at the multiple factors, um, uh, which I'm going to go through, uh, the, the network effect of a base layer is just a lot stronger because um, I think you, when you look at the most successful um, uh, so-called scaling solution or, or other chain to gain a lot of user recently, it was a Binance Smart Chain. So what did Binance Smart Chain did well that allowed them to gain so much user in a short amount of time is using the same block explorer, which is MetaMask, and uh, using the same, sorry, same block explorer, which is Etherscan. Uh, they use they, the same team builder for them called BSC Scan, and they use the same uh, wallet, which is uh, the MetaMask, and use the EVM uh, so that they can plug in with uh, Etherscan and uh, MetaMask. So this is the network effect of Ethereum right now. And why and the Binance previously tried to build their own DEX before, but it failed, like which is called the, the Binance chain. And they have their own DEX built in because they did not inherit that network effect. And Binance right now is likely the largest uh, crypto company with the crypto company with the largest user base. Even with that, they cannot bootstrap their own 
chain successfully without relying on Ethereum's network effect. So I think that's, that's a very good case study on how strong the network effect of Ethereum is. And I think the infrastructure that on a base layer, it's just a lot harder to migrate on because when you talk to a technical guy, you have the subgraph you need to build, you have the dev toolings, all this thing. It's not like you build like a DeFi app on a ETH layer one at that the user can easily migrate because it's just like a front end. They just have the MetaMask. But using a new layer one is like a totally new user experience uh, and, and the infrastructure that you need to ha- use is also very different. It's like using to... Um, I think the best analogy uh, will be like, like an app store analogy. Like right now, the two most dominant uh, app store is like a Google and an Apple. So a very big... Microsoft try to compete in this. They try to have their own app store as well. But even a company of this size couldn't do it and they uh, they just retreat in the end. Like they just no longer doing this. Right now, the market is just between Apple and Google. So I think this is probably the best analogy to understand the, the network effect of a, a base layer like Ethereum. And while the app, uh, like it's a lot easier to like, uh, you know, to migrate between different layer one platform, right? Yeah. I think perhaps to expand upon the answer, we could also include Ethereum layer twos where once you have your protocol built, as you said, like once you have Aave built, once you have a Uniswap built, it's easy for you to just deploy that on Binance Smart Chain or any EVM compatible app. And it's also easy for you to build that on Ethereum's own layer two, right? And so Ethereum as a base protocol can have Ethereum flavored derivatives one of which could be Binance Smart Chain, another one could be Polygon, another one could be Optimism or Arbitrum. And these are all these are all different, you know, chains that could be the, your app to be deployed upon, but you're stuck inside of the EVM ecosystem. While building the actual Aave the application or Uniswap the application or, uh, you know, any of the other DeFi apps that we know and love, building that from scratch is actually the hard part. And once you do that hard part, and you do it on an EVM compatible chain, then you're kind of stuck inside the EVM compatible world, no matter no matter what chain you're on. And you know, usually Ethereum and itself obviously benefits from EVM compatible stuff, but also most importantly, Ethereum L2s also benefit from EVM compatible stuff. Arthur, how do you how do you uh, view Ethereum L2s as playing into Ethereum the Ethereum moat conversation? I think that um, it's just very obvious that uh, there are major um, major help to the Ethereum uh, on a especially on a scaling roadmap. And I think this is also come from the community wanting to find a way to, to solve the scaling issue before Eve two point is live. And I think all these are actually just a, a very entrenched, further entrenched Ethereum's network effect because. All this uh, layer two solution will need to adopt uh, Ethereum's uh, base infrastructure. Uh, EVM compatible will make their adoption happen much faster. And also having a very supporting similar infrastructure uh, and dev tooling will just help them go a long way. So this definitely helped to entrench uh, the network effect of Ethereum. So actually, I want, also want to uh, come back a bit on something that I didn't mention on why do I think the network effect of Ethereum is so entrenched. I think there's also two uh, another two thing which I think uh, is very specific to layer one. One is the distribution of the ownership. I think uh, right now most of the new smart contract platform is uh, proof of stake based, and I think that uh, I I think most people agree that a uh, proof of stake there's a lot of advantage over proof of work, which I'm not gonna go into repeat that. But I think one thing uh, there is one uh, slight disadvantage which, which I think is it's harder to decentralize the ownership of the proof of stake uh, blockchain over time compared to proof of work because proof of work, the miner will always need to sell that coin to uh, to cover the operating expenses. But for proof of stake, um, the selling pressure is a little bit lesser. They, the, the, the holder will still sell that. I think everyone have a take profit point. I think like for people like us, we like we say that when Ethereum is at 20,000, 20K or 50K or 100K, then we will start to sell a little bit more of our Ethereum. Um, I think it's the same for Proof of Stake. If they will gradually decentralize over time, but the selling pressure will not be as strong as the Proof of Work base. So any new Proof of Stake blockchain will take a much longer time to decentralize and distribute their ownership compared to Ethereum. 
And I think that is a part of the, the, the advantage of Ethereum compared to other proof of stake blockchain because when ownership is very concentrated, uh, it's always lead to a slightly less uh, censorship resistant, right? Like because they, you know, a few hold, token holder have most of the stake. And it also take a time for a lot of the proof of stake platform to achieve a, a me, what I call the minimum viable censorship resistant level. Um, because I think that, um, I think decentralization is a spectrum, but uh, what really, but you can't have to be like the extreme end of the spectrum. Like we only have 10 nodes and half of the nodes are run by the same parties. Um, so I think that is definitely, you do not even cross a minimum threshold. But I think for when you cross a certain threshold, then I think uh, people can start to trust that yeah, there's some form of sensor resistance built in and people can really start to see where is it going to on the decentralization roadmap. And I think both on both this factor, it's very hard to compete with Ethereum because Ethereum has a very clear roadmap on how they plan to decentralize further. And yeah, this whole ownership distribution is just a very strong mode that's very hard to overtake. So you think Ethereum will continue to be dominant, but other layer ones will still have some role to play. I, I'm curious about this. If you had to pick one non-Ethereum layer one to bet on, what would it be and why? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to get a lot of hate for this. <laughs> but um, <laughs> as, as an investor, I, I have to say, after doing our research, I believe that um, Solana right now has, uh, has, has some potential. Um, because I think that if you want to compete Ethereum, you can't compete on uh, on factor where Ethereum is the strongest at. I think that you can't compete with Ethereum on being the most decentralized um, and you can't compete with Ethereum on the same design and architecture. So I think that if I really want to bet on a EVE competitor, I want to bet on a protocol that is taking a completely different approach. And I think a lot of the other EVE killer they actually are just making some minor tweaks to the Ethereum and have some marginal improvement. I think that alone is not sufficient. So I think what I think uh, Solana has, a, why I think Solana has a potential is because they are taking a very different approach. They will not be as decentralized as Ethereum and they, they actually accept that trade-off. Um, but I do, they, they do have a roadmap on how do they decentralize it, but they, they actually accepted the fact that they will not have like, you know, few hundred thousand nodes running their uh, 500,000 nodes in the future because they require a certain level of hardware requirement. Um, but they want to find the, like the, 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 the more enthusiast hobbyists they're willing to spend a few thousand dollars to run their nodes. And they accept that as a fine uh, trade-off. And their scaling is really uh, a lot rely on the hardware, and which I think is a very different approach compared to Ethereum. So which I, if I want to bet on something, I want to bet on something that's totally different, not where you're making a marginal improvement to Ethereum. Yep. Hey guys, I hope you are enjoying the conversation with Arthur Zero X thus far. In the second half of the show, we ask Arthur's opinion about Ethereum killers, ETH killers, and where, whether he thinks that there is room in the market or not for them. I thoroughly enjoyed his take there. He's got a very specific opinion about this. And then we also ask Arthur about the different ways that the East approaches Ethereum, Bitcoin, DeFi versus the West and how different areas inside of the East uh, the Chinese speaking languages, the English speaking Asian countries, or Japan and Korea, how they all approach Ethereum and, and DeFi separately. And a, a little hint there is that they each kind of approach this industry as a reflection of the of the culture that they have at home. You know, shocker, the culture dic dictates the way that we approach things. Uh, and Arthur goes in and, and talks about the way that different areas of Asia look and, and, and have a stance towards DeFi and Ethereum. Really enjoyed the second half of this conversation, so don't go anywhere. But first, we have to take a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got into crypto in 2017, and it's been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and in over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various different crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens. And it's one of the few exchanges that has liquid die markets. Gemini just launched their earn program where you can earn up to 7.4% interest on 26 various crypto assets. If you're tired of paying fees in DeFi or you don't want to worry about DeFi exploits, but you still want to earn interest on your crypto assets, 
Gemini Urn is the product for you. Another product I'm stoked to get my hands on is the Gemini Crypto Back Credit Card, which gives you 3% cash back on all of your purchases, but paid to you in your preferred crypto asset. When I get my Gemini credit card, I'm going to make sure that I get my cash back in ETH. So whenever I buy something, I get a little bit of ETH bonus back to me at the same time. You can open up a free account in under three minutes at gemini.com slash go bankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after sign up, you'll be gifted a free $15 Bitcoin bonus. Check them out at gemini.com slash go bankless. The Aave protocol is a decentralized liquidity protocol on Ethereum which allows users to supply and borrow certain crypto assets. Aave version 2 has a ton of cool features that makes using the Aave protocol even more powerful. With Aave, you can leverage the full power of DeFi money Legos, yield, and composability all in one application. On Aave, there are a ton of assets that you can supply to the protocol in order to gain yield, and all of those same assets can also be borrowed from the protocol if you have supplied collateral. Here you can see me borrowing 200 USDC against my portfolio of a number of different DeFi tokens in ETH. I'll choose a variable interest rate because it's a lower rate than the stable interest rate option, but I could choose the stable interest rate option if I wanted to lock in that interest rate in permanently. V2 also features the ability for users to swap collateral without having to withdraw their assets, trade them on Uniswap, and then deposit them back into Aave. With Aave, users can do this in one seamless transaction, saving you time and gas costs. Check out the power of Aave at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E.com. Arthur, I want to turn the conversation to a more global uh, perspective about crypto and DeFi and Ethereum. And while we are this global internet-based industry, we all come from our specific parts of the globe. And we come into DeFi, we come into crypto with our pers uh, pers uh, specific backgrounds and uh, specific like ways of viewing things. And one thing I've always uh, been curious about and never really been able to get my finger on the pulse of is how uh, the East generally at large views crypto and Ethereum differently than the West. And I'm assuming the, the East is a very large place. There's subdivisions inside of the East. How, how is overall, how is the East viewing this industry perhaps differently or just prioritizes things in this different industry differently than the West? And again, and how are um, the, how is the East also subdivided into different sectors that view this industry differently? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I I was uh, categorize the the Asia or the East community into different parts. First of all, you have the English speaking region, uh, which basically uh, counts uh, India and most of the Southeast Asia. So I think these are actually um I think due to the language the lack of language barrier. So the adoption of DeFi actually has been, I think, fairly fairly com I wouldn't say common, but among the crypto community, I think they are one of the fastest to understand DeFi and actually use it in a pretty uh, significant way. So actually from our understanding, a lot of the Southeast Asia country have a pretty decent DeFi community. Uh, they might be a bit localized, uh, but yeah, they, they are using DeFi uh, application in a pretty major manner. And then you have the Chinese speaking region, uh, which is basically China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And this country, uh, I think initially uh, they were a bit skeptical because I think China back then in 2018 have a big uh, like a transaction mining uh, trend uh, among the central exchanges, which is quite similar to liquidity mining currently. Um, and as a result, they were quite skeptical for most period of time. But I think uh, 2020, after the DeFi summer, a lot of them have actually uh, started to use DeFi app in a major manner. And I think there's a lot more... Um, a user up as a result of that. And then you also have the, I think the two other major crypto user, uh, which is Japan and Korea. But I think, I think largely due to language, language barrier and a cultural factor, uh, these two region have not really been using DeFi that much um, compared to the other places. So, yeah, so this is how I would uh, categorize them. And yeah, I think when it comes to China, I think, um, the Chinese speaking region, um, what we have seen is they are usually a lot more practical and uh, a, I think slight, slightly less focused on the ethos. I think what they really cherish about the, the, the DeFi is the self-custody of the asset because I think that they have seen uh, the 
trouble with OKEX uh, recently, which they, nobody can withdraw any balances for like, uh, I think two months. And I think that by, by using DeFi, they, this really uh, prevent this issue from happening again. But I think on the decentralization aspect on like uh, how decentralized this protocol is, I think they assess a lot more trust in the, in, in, in the, in the team and to the player itself. Uh, but for, I think for the English speaking community, they, we just want to have a lot more built in check and balances. Um, so I think this is probably some of the more obvious difference we can see. Yeah. But I think most of them have accepted the, the benefit of using DeFi apps compared to, um, to like a central exchange. And I think everyone just like the fact that they are, they're being rewarded by being an early adopter and user of DeFi protocols. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really interesting. There's, th there is a, a common ethos of crypto that you're going to find no matter what culture or background that, that you come from. But I, I think in your answer, I think it's, uh, and maybe I'm um, hopefully not trying to just create something out of nothing, but I, I think what I'm seeing is that everyone is coming to crypto for the reasons of the merits of crypto. They're the same universally, but different regions of the world or different regions of Asia emphasize something that their legacy financial system that they're coming from is really lacking. For example, you talked about how in, in China, people really, really value that bare asset nature of being able to hold your own keys. Well, China is a, a top-down authoritarian uh, uh, region. You know, like you would want that power to be able to control your own keys, especially coming from that, that region. And you talked about how uh, Japan and Korea don't really go into the protocols as, a, as deep as maybe what, what we might do in the West. And they kind of stay on uh, focusing on exchanges. And that also makes sense from a countries that don't have that deep of a history of financial markets or financialization. They don't, they aren't too comfortable going that deep into the world of crypto because that's just not where they came from, from their, their legacy markets. Uh, am I reading too far into this or, or do you agree with that take as well? I, I think uh, I largely agree with that take. Um, I think the historical and cultural factors um, likely will dictate the pace of adoption. Um, yeah, I, I think that's definitely, uh, definitely true. How much of this is just like language um, translation stuff though to Arthur, do you think? Like, I don't know, um, not, not, I don't know what DeFi actually looks like in say Mandarin, for instance, are there DeFi interfaces that are uh, that are created um, in native Chinese, or is is that something the DeFi community can work on more? Is internationalization and non English speaking education communication interfaces? I I think that um, it has to be taken as a holistic approach. I think by just doing a translation, that's a very good start. Um, but I think ultimately um, it makes sense to have some people in the community to speak to them and just gradually build that. So I think I want to bring an example. Um, I think MakerDAO is probably one of the most successful DeFi protocol when it comes to adoption in the Chinese speaking region. So I think one of the results is because they hire a, a very strong Chinese community lead that really know the market there very well. And as a re result, are able to communicate with a lot of the crypto user in, in China. Um, but actually most of the other DeFi protocol do not have such a person to on the, to sit on the ground and able to do that to their community. So I think that um, that is probably a more important factor. You have someone in that area to uh, like a promote and uh, evangelize the, the stuff. I think this also happened in Ethereum, right? I mean, Vitalik uh, at the very early days uh, go to ch went to China a lot to evangelize Ethereum. And as a result, uh, Ethereum still have a very big community in China, but a lot of the other protocol just did not do that. And as a result, they just do not get the same mind share. Yeah. So I think that you always need a few uh, evangelists to help to hold the protocol. Um, so I think, and yeah, I think language translation is a good start. Um, having a good interface is a good start, but you always need some local evangelists. It's funny. It always comes back to people as the layer zero in yep. crypto. That's what this entire yep. industry is uh, is based on. Um, yep. Yeah, fascinating. So really quick before we leave sort of the, the Asia perspective here, I'm curious your thoughts, Arthur, on um, all of the 
the uh, the Bitcoin mining stories that we've heard uh, from China of, of um, you know leg legislation regulation the Chinese government coming down hard on Bitcoin mining. Um, how should we interpret that, and what does that mean for crypto in China and DeFi? Um, great question. I think that uh, the interpretation should be fairly straightforward. Um, I think right now China they just want to have a lot more control. Uh, over the financial market. Uh, and in their view, uh, crypto is part of the financial market. And it actually, it might affect their ability to further regulate or control the financial market as well. So as a result, they want to uh, prevent this activity from happening. So the exodus of Chinese miner is real. So we know a, a few major Chinese uh, miner and the mining pool, they are all going overseas to find uh, and look for a new home. So yeah, I think that you can also see from the hash rate as well. I don't think these are coming back because it takes a long time to build all this uh, infrastructure. So I think the exodus will, will just continue and they're going to find a new home elsewhere. And you're going to see uh, the concentration of hash rate in China becoming a history. That's my prediction. Um, because I think even if let's say this is relaxed in the further, um, the, the uncertainty will just prevent all these big miners from reinvesting back in the region. That, that's my view. And I think that another big factor is the fiat on ramp uh, in China is being curtailed further. So it will become harder and harder to convert uh, the local currency, which is the renminbi, into crypto, or uh, vice versa uh, going forward because they just want to clamp down on all the OTC trading activities. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest OTC trader was actually put into Jill, I think, um, yeah, yeah, he was the, the I think called, a guy called Zhao Dong. So sorry, I, I might get a fact wrong, but that's why I heard. Um, and so yeah, but I think so we can expect. I think it's reasonable to expect the growth from the Chinese side to slow down a little bit, um, because they just have a harder time to fail on ramp. But I think that the community that those that are the initiated will continue to stay. Like the some of them, they will just always keep some of their balances in the crypto space, like some of their net worth uh, in, the, in the stable coin, in some Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, and some of them, they probably just, uh, they know that it will be hard to like convert this money into fiat, but they were okay with it. And I think this is what's going to happen going forward. I will say, Arthur, it seems like your jurisdiction, uh, Singapore, is absolutely crushing it when it comes to uh, response to to crypto, um, like the Singapore government seems to be handling crypto with a very open mind uh, and also very uh, soberly. Is is that what it's like on the ground? Are are you impressed with what Singapore is doing, or are there more subtleties there? Uh, I'm. I have to say, I'm definitely impressed. Um, so, but there's definitely sub subtlety is there as well. Uh, so I think that first of all, the regulator, um, even up to the top one, really try to understand what is it about and they did uh and i think right now their understanding is uh probably one of the top uh when it comes to from a like a global regulated point of view so they understand what DeFi is they understand the advertised benefit of DeFi. uh they also understand the problem right now but whether they fully buy into the the so-called the the benefit of DeFi, uh we are not 100 percent sure yet say so they do know the benefit that we've been talking about but whether they believe it or not, uh, I think that remains to be seen. So I think they are waiting to see more evidence because I think the key thing to convince them right now is that most of the, uh, the traction in DeFi is just restricted to the crypto space. It doesn't touch the mainstream user yet. So I think in that regard, they are still skeptical that whether the benefit of DeFi can translate to the real world activities, which I think all of us believe will be. But I think just the, the roadmap towards that happening. But I think when it comes to regulation, um, Singapore ultimately is not a very big country, so it will follow the the FATF guidance and the major key uh, law being drafted by the major uh, like the bigger country like US and EU. So in that sense, um, yeah, it's definitely a lot friendlier and they are understanding, but uh, yeah, there's the subtlety is that that doesn't mean that they're gonna regulate this thing in a completely opposite manner compared to the guidance issued by the global financial policy setting body. Yeah, so I think that's a subtlety there. But I think the entire approach is also uh, a lot less 
prosecutorial and less aggressive in the sense that um, when you're doing something that's not 100% compliant and in gray area, uh, the first action is not to, you know, going after you, but it's instead to try to understand what you're doing and make you compliant. So yeah, so it's, yeah. So I think that's the difference in the approach there. Arthur, as we come down to the close in this conversation, and thank you so much for giving us some of your time. This has been, I've already learned so much. I want to ask you what you are looking for out of the crypto industry in the second half of 2021. What is really missing that would that you really think needs to be here as a part of this industry? What, what, are, the, what are the next innovations that you see coming that you are really looking uh, forward to? I think it's, it's really about scaling. Um, I think we have seen uh, the success of Polygon and also Binance Smart Chain. Um, I think more scaling solution will just help Ethereum to scale and more DeFi app uh, to be able to onboard more users as well. I think we have, I think the DeFi protocol on Ethereum just cross, I think, uh, I think two million. Uh, well, sorry, I think definitely have crossed one million user over time. I'm looking forward to this uh, crossing uh, five million and ten million probably by end of the year. I think it's possible if we have a very successful scaling solution. And uh, just more and more users starting to use a uh, DeFi application. Yeah, so I think we have went beyond the zero to one phase uh, in DeFi. Uh, I think next step is really about growing the user phase, growing the user base, and uh, just uh, getting more and more product to the hand of the uh, the normal crypto user and just a mainstream user. Wait, so that's did you say that you think that we can f five to ten x the users of this industry by the end of this year? Yes, uh, I think it's, it's possible. Uh, if the scaling solution is a, uh, is a uh, yeah, is 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 good enough. Yep, I think it's definitely possible. Why is scale such a such a, a crux? Why is that? Why is everything hinge on scale? Because I think that uh, you can look at this from like a traditional tech company, right? I think the user experience on the, the initial user experience matters a lot. So I think if you do not have a good uh, scaling solution, the initial uh, like where if users are being turned off by the first impression, they're just not going to come back. So I think it's important that we are able to onboard them with a very good first impression and then they continue to stay. Hmm. That 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 is a pretty bold prediction. Uh, and I also love it. So five <laughs> to 10 million DeFi users by the end of the year is possible. Um, just let's end with uh, a couple more predictions, Arthur, if you're willing to indulge us, sir. We love predictions, so please indulge us. What do you think the total locked value in DeFi is going to be? And then how about the price of ETH at the end of 2021? Again, fun predictions, maybe right, maybe sure. wrong, just fun. Um, okay, so the, the, okay, do you count BSC TVL as part of the TVL? Do we want uh, to count that? <laughs> do, do we count it, David? I, I, I kind of count DeFi, whatever is on DeFi Pulse is close to being countered. Okay. Counted, okay, so let's probably use... Probably not Binance Smart Chain. Okay, let's use DeFi Pulse as the Oracle. Unless they add it, though. Um, if they added it, then we'll count it. <laughs> um, I think we will hit... I think we will hit 80 billion. Yeah, 80 billion by the end of the year. 80 billion. So just a okay, little that, bit that's a bit less. That's not very bullish. Okay, let's, let's do 100 billion. <laughs> <laughs> 100 billion, double. Okay, it's gotta how about, be a bullish prediction. Give us price to V. As of if um, I think it's very possible we will hit um, I, I can I give a range? <laughs> yeah, give a range. Oh, absolutely, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think five to ten thousand. Ooh. Wow. All right. That's, Retaking that's new that's highs. Awesome. Do you guys do you guys yes. hold ETH? Is that part of the DeFi portfolio or is that more... Yes, we hold ETH because ETH is a uh, ETH is money and uh, ETH is a major <laughs> asset within the DeFi space, we hold it a lot of time to provide liquidity to the protocol that we are supporting because most of the pair, even with the dominance of stablecoin, are still against ETH. Like, um, yeah, like for, uh, let's say for Balancer, is against ETH and for a lot of the other liquidity provision we do, it's all against ETH. So we always hold ETH in our fund um, to, yeah, for various reasons and also from an investment reason as well. Gotta you hold hear it here first, ETH is money. 
<laughs> not the first time you've heard it here <laughs> you definitely heard it here first <laughs> well arthur it has been an absolute pleasure to chat with you uh you're just full of insights man i um wish you best of luck getting to a billion dollar mark with uh defiance capital that that seems like the next milestone congrats on all on all your success and thanks for joining us on bankless thank you for having me guys um uh, really appreciate it and yeah hope you guys have uh, probably 1 million subscriber and listener soon as well. <laughs> there you go, guys. That's what's in store. In order to make that happen, let's get to action items. Uh, give us that five-star review. David, how are we doing on five-star reviews on iTunes? We could always use more. We don't have a million yet, so we definitely <laughs> need a few more five-star reviews. Wherever you listen to podcasts, if you could go into that podcast player and give us those five-star reviews, that is how Bankless climbs up the charts in the worlds of, of finance and investing on iTunes and Spotify and how the Bankless journey reaches as many ears as possible. So if you have enjoyed your journey westward on the Bankless journey, help share it with more people by giving us those five-star reviews. The other action item I have for you today is to go follow Arthur0x on Twitter. Arthur, could you give us your Twitter handle? Make sure we get that correct. Sure. Uh, my Twitter handle is Arthur underscore zero X. All right, guys, give that Twitter handle a follow. Arthur is always tweeting out insightful DeFi intelligence. Of course, risks and disclaimers, guys. DeFi is risky. ETH is risky. All of crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.